Amen and amen. You guys can be seated. We're going to stand up again at some point in this service. So uh, some of you guys who are in your uh, New Year's, get right. Uh, you're going to do plenty of squats today, okay? And so, uh, hey, we're so glad you're here. And uh, if I have not had a chance to meet you, uh, my name is Kevin. And uh, it's an honor uh, to be here to serve uh, as one of the pastors here. And uh, I want to also uh, welcome anybody watching online. And um, we are uh, on day seven of a 10-day fast. And many of you guys have been participating uh, with us in some way. And uh, fast is simply drawing near to God and saying no to some things here, uh, earthly, some some food. He's it, pushing some of that to the side and saying, God, I, I want you more than I want the desires of my flesh. And uh, we've been crying out to God. And I don't know about you, but... but um, I've been praying for revival. And I've been praying for personal revival. I've been praying for corporate revival, which is through church revival. And I've been praying for, for national and city revival. That God would truly be glorified and lifted up. And I know we throw around the term revival often. Like it's, it's one of those words in church that, you know, what, what is revival? Is it just a bunch of loud people? Absolutely not. Revival uh, has been defined as nothing more nothing less than a new beginning of radical obedience to God. And I don't know what, what you've allowed to get into your life. I don't know the decisions that you've made, some, some of the things that you've fallen in more in love with than you have with, with God and the voice of God. But revival simply is the church falling in love with Jesus all over again. Today I want to I want to talk about that a little bit. I want to talk about passion and I want to talk about falling in love with Jesus every single moment, every single day of our life. And I, I want us to to have a time today where uh, we're reminded uh, through his word, through scripture, that, that, that Jesus truly is the, the savior of the universe, that he is the focal point of all of our hearts because we are the centerpiece of his creation. He's created you and I in his image, and the devil wants to come, still kill, and destroy the image that God has created. And God wants to uh, make new today uh, some things that have taken place in people's lives. In Matthew 6.33, which the series that we, uh, and the word that we feel from the Lord for this year is to seek first. And Matthew 6, 33 says it this way. It says, but seek first his righteousness and his kingdom. And all these things will be given to you when? When we seek first. And I want to call the church today to seek first. I want to call us to, to, to seek God like maybe we've never have sought God before. I want to uh, teach us and I want the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to, to cause us to depend on God. Maybe like we've never depended on God before that Many of you have resolutions in the new year, and, and I think faith and, and following Jesus is one of those resolutions, and uh, I just pray that it's more than a resolution, that it's actually a life change, that, that God truly does uh, a work inside of us that, that we cannot contain, that we have to share with other people, and, uh, and so today I, I want to speak about this, and I want to speak about, uh, in Revelation chapter 2 today, uh, is where our foundational text is going to be found, and um, there's an encouragement to the church. There is a challenge given to the church, and, and, and God is wanting to speak to the angel of the church of Ephesus, and uh, there are some things that have happened in this church. There's been some incredible miracles. This church now has a, a longstanding history when we get to reading this part. This, this church has been around for about 43 years now when this text is written to the church of Ephesus, and I want us to, with those ears, as if it's God speaking to you and I, to His church today, uh, to listen, to allow uh, the Holy Spirit to speak to us from this text in Revelation chapter 2. Uh, and starting in verse 2, it says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. In other translations would say the love that you had for me and the love that you had for others. The passion that you once had. It says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you repent. I see you. I see your work. I see your labor. I see your toil. I've seen the good things that you've done. God's commending his church. He's celebrating his church. But he also says, I have this one thing against you. That you have forsaken the love 
that you once had, the love that you had at first, and when you were first getting started, and it was all about me. And he commends them and he says, listen, it's great the work that you're doing. But you've lost that passion you had at first. You've lost that first love. And God's saying today to his church, it's time to return to his first love. It's time for us as a church to return to our first love. It's time for us to do the things we once did. When we were new believers, when this whole thing was absolutely real and it changed our life, when we shared our faith at work, when we invited people to church, it's time for us to return and do the things that we did at first. Repent and do the things you did at first. I want to speak to you today from the title, simply the, the title of our, our message of our time together today is Return. Return, because the truth is Jesus is returning for his church. No man knows the hour. Nobody knows today. But I know that I'm commanded to go into all the world to make disciples. It's the great commission, Matthew 28. And I want to serve Jesus every day with that kind of fire in my bones that knows tomorrow's not promised, but I can do everything that I can today to point people to Jesus. Return. Come back to your first love. Do the things you did at first. To repent to turn back to God. So Jesus, we give you this service. Jesus, would you speak? God, not my words, not my will, but yours be done in this room this morning. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would stir something inside of us to cause us to return to our first love. That God, for those of us who following Jesus and Serving you has become routine, mundane. God, I pray for a fresh fire. God, I pray for people today whose flames at one point have now dwindled to an ember that's on its way to be burnt out. Spirit of God, would you blow today and ignite a flame inside of us? So God, we thank you. We praise you. We thank you for the Rams win last night. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen and amen. We had to sneak that in, church. We had to thank God uh, for that today. Uh, which, which, speaking of that, how cool would it be uh, for an all-L.A. Super Bowl, right? Like the Chargers and the Rams, and, and this is the Lord's land. He loves this city. He loves this, this, this town. And so uh, I'm just saying it would be, be awesome as, as fellow Californians uh, to enjoy. Uh, I know I've got some friends uh, all across the U.S. that I would love to brag to and say, hey, look at the Super Bowl. It's all Los Angeles. You're welcome. Uh, Jesus loves us. So. Uh, hey, this uh, message that uh, I've been wrestling with God with for probably the past five or six months um, uh, has been a message that um, God, God began to speak to me back in August. And oftentimes what I'll do is I'll hear God speak in and I'll just jot some things down. I'll, I'll be reminded of some verses that God's speaking to my ear, some challenges he's whispering, and I'll make note of it. And uh, when I feel that, that, that God's saying now is the time is when those messages will be spoken. And uh, back in August, uh, for me, I, I went to uh, the church that I grew up in. And uh, this past summer, uh, I had a chance to go. And the church that I grew up in, they do a big church conference every year. A couple thousand uh, people get together. They worship Jesus. There's incredible messages that are shared and whatnot. And, uh, and so I, I went back. And um, this past summer, uh, I'm walking through the church. And for me, this was the church that uh, I gave my life to Jesus in. This was the church that I was called into ministry. This is the church that I was baptized in. This is the church that I met my wife in. This is the church that, that, that has radically changed my life through the Spirit of God. And I'm, I, I'm walking down almost memory lane. And I, I remember this was the church also that I preached my first sermon in. This was the church that, that, that I, I led my first ministry. I led a, a junior high ministry of a couple hundred smelly junior hires. Listen, if you can lead junior hires... You got a call in your life. But I remember going down and walking down memory lane. And I remember the, the, the memories that I had, the memories and, and the passion in which I remember serving God with. And as a 16 year old, when I was called into ministry and I felt God say, and through prophecy and through words that were spoken over my life, it was, what was this incredible reminder. I remember serving God and, and I remember even the first message uh, that I preached at 16 years old to a room full of junior high and high school students 
talking about the storms of life, talking about how Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you, talking about taking a step of faith. And I remember preaching so passionately. I, I remember even uh, every Saturday getting to the church early to vacuum the church to wipe down a couple thousand seats because I knew that there were going to be people that are coming through those doors who are walking through some significant difficult times in life and they need a little bit of hope. And I wanted to create an environment for people to encounter Jesus that was distraction free. I remember serving God uh, with such passion in such a way that, that it was almost like whenever the doors of the church were open, I was there and I was there to serve and I was there to do whatever I could to help people. And I, I thought about, I remember the passion as a 16-year-old, to see my high school saved. I remember the passion that started with my basketball team. I remember the passion that I had to say, God, because you've changed my life and because you are a real God, my heart is that other people would experience the same love that I experienced, even as a 16-year-old. I remember inviting friends to church all the time in high school, risking reputation, which, by the way, how many high school friends do you still talk to? The people that you try to please your whole life. That popular group you tried to fit in with. This is a message for some high school students. Stop wasting your time trying to appease people that won't even talk to you three months from now. But I remember this passion, and I remember inviting friends to church and seeing them. And at the end of the message, I remember seeing them, them respond and give their life to Jesus in tears, even as a 16, 17-year-old rolling down my face, watching my friends give their life to Jesus. So I'm walking down memory lane this past August, and I'm thinking about all the things, and I feel God begin to smack me upside the head and say, remember that passion? Remember when you served me with that type of passion? Remember when you would do whatever it took to invite people in, to reach people, to help people see Jesus? And I felt God say, return. Return to your first love. Return to the passion you had at once. Let, let me flip it on you now that I've been very candid and very honest and ask you this question. Do you remember when you first gave your life to Jesus? Do you remember the environment? Do you remember the things that changed in your life? Do you remember the passion that you had? Oh, I love the passion of new believers. Oh, I love the passion of watching new believers say, I don't care. I've just found out the best news, the good news of Jesus, and I want everybody to know. Do you remember that service that you gave your life to Jesus? Do you remember that friend that led you to Jesus? Do you remember having that type of passion where you'd order your coffee at a Starbucks and you'd invite the barista to church? Do you remember having that type of passion that at your workplace, you would actually share the gospel with people? And maybe that was 20 years ago for you. God's saying today, on the second Sunday of 2019, return to your first love. Do the things you did at first. I have this one thing against you, the scripture says, that you've abandoned your first love. Revelation chapter 2 is seven letters to seven churches. These are very real churches with real people that have real history, have had real problems and real challenges. And this letter to the church of Ephesus, when this is written, it's now about 43 years old. It's 43 years since Paul started this church. And I'm thinking and I'm reminded of the passion that Paul led with in the two years he was there leading the church of Ephesus and the passion that, that, that even helped start that church. I'm, I'm thinking of the passion that Paul had. You remember when he ran into these 12 guys who were coined as disciples of John at that time and he asked them, he said, hey, have you guys received and been baptized with the Holy Spirit? And they said, I didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. And so Paul begins to talk to them and tell them about the Holy Spirit and reach out his hands and lay his hands on them and pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. And guess what? They received the Holy Spirit. And then there was this passion that broke out. And then actually crowds started forming around saying there's something different about these people. They're so passionate. And that passion upset the Jewish, leader, leaders of, re, Jewish religious leaders of that time. They were, they were upset, and, and they didn't like the prevalence of the gospel, and they didn't like the passion that was represented in these people. And so they did all that they could to push Paul out and say, you can't preach that here. This was how the church started. Not a lot of people, but boy, did they have a lot of passion. They had the type of passion that, 
that, that, that they, they would do all that they could to share the good news of Jesus, every single one of them. And now 43 years have gone by. And Paul was met with great opposition at the beginning. He was met with great opposition and he's encouraging them. And what's amazing to me and the point that I want to draw us to is, is this today, that passion upsets apathy. Passion upsets apathy. You've had apathetic Jewish religious leaders at this time who are just walking like robots through the motions. Paul shows up on the scene under the influence of the Spirit of God and preaches a passionate gospel about the Jesus that changed his life. And apathetic people, apath apathy begins to get disturbed and they do all that they can. You, you ever find that in your life? Jim's a great example of it, right? At the beginning of the year, everybody's so passionate. And it drives for a little bit, but then apathy settles in. And then we complain. We complain about this, and we complain about that. And let me say this, that, that complaint is not a good look on anybody. Complaining is not a good look on any of us. I had a conversation with a friend who leads a large church, very large church, this, two weeks ago. And we were talking about this, and he's been pastoring for, for 25 years. And I just I said, so do you, do you deal with just this apathy? Do you deal with, with, with people that, that come and have their own opinions? And he says, usually people will come into our church, oftentimes from a different church, and typically the same way that they came into your church is the same way that they're going to leave your church. And here's what he went on to say. He went on and he just talked about how much these people complained. And they complained, 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 complained. They complained about the previous church. They're going to complain about this church. And what he said, it was interesting, and it, it, we had this conversation. And as a dad, it really clicked because the complaint, the easy complaint all the time, the easy complaint is I'm not just being fed. You, you ever heard that one? I'm going to raise my hand for my friends who have heard that one because uh, none of us have ever said that uh, in any context here at all uh, because the preaching's incredible. But here's the thing. You know who complains about food? Kids. My kids complain about food. I'm hungry. Dad, feed me. Adults bring food to the table. And if we've been following Jesus for some time and we're still complaining about things that we should have got over as kids, it's time for some of us to bring food to the table. Step up and serve. Step up and do something beyond your comfort zone. It's time for apathy to break in this valley in Jesus' name. Listen, I'm so glad that you're here. We're glad that you're a part of this church. But part of, being a, 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 part of the thing about being a part of this church is the Spirit of God is going to get a hold of you. And it's going to change your life. And it's going to ignite a passion on the inside of you that causes you to leave here changed and different. Amen. Oh, we bless people as they go. But boy, let us not be people who become apathetic and just complain and get stuck in a religious system that is struggling to advance the gospel that changed every single one of our lives. So Paul had this passion. It was interesting because they kicked Paul out of the synagogues, and so Paul's like, I'll just go into lectures halls and start preaching. Paul preached everywhere. Paul let nothing hold him back. He had no excuses. What's amazing to me is I think that God is the most strategic being that's ever been. He's so strategic. And I think it's so strategic that God put Paul, who had all this passion, in a prominent city like Ephesus. Ephesus at this time was about 300,000 people. It was the fourth largest city in the world at that time. It was the seventh wonder of the world. It was home of the temple of Artemis, daughter of Zeus. It was a port city where they would bring in goods and exchanges. It was a large city that was growing rapidly, and God took the guy with passion and put him in an important city. And you think about this, and you think about the passion that Paul had, the passion that Paul had to preach the gospel, to reach those people. And like I said, they may have not had a lot of people at the start of this church, but boy, did they have a whole lot of passion. But what's interesting is Paul didn't start in Ephesus. Paul didn't start in the city with 300,000 people. Paul started in Damascus, in isolation. But it was the same passion that Paul had 
in isolation in Damascus, God has given him a bigger platform in the city of Ephesus. The point that I want to draw our attention to today is this, is if you can't do it with passion in a small place, why would God promote you to a bigger place? We'll go our whole lives complaining about our job and not having opportunities rather than saying, God, I'm thankful for the opportunity that I have and I'm going to use every opportunity that I have to influence people and point them to you in this current situation. Oh, but I'll do it one day. I'll do it one day. When God gives me that stage, then I'll be passionate about God. No, it's not how it works because if you can't do it with passion in a small place, David this is a good Old Testament illustration of this New Testament principle. David, you remember David in the pasture, keeping sheep, protecting his flock from bears and lions, passionately serving God, passionately worshiping God in a pasture. And it was the same passion in that pasture that God used and promoted him to a palace. And you remember on the specific day where David got this massive victory. And he took down this Goliath, this enemy that was haunting a nation, haunting a city. And God used him, this little shepherd boy, and a few little stones and a little sling to take out this massive, massive Goliath. But it was the same passion in the pasture that God used. There's something about having a passion to serve Jesus, to worship Jesus, to do all that you can in whatever season, in whatever circumstance and situation that you may find yourself in. So 43 years have gone by now. Can I tell you this? This church is about 33 years old. I wonder the type of passion 33 years ago that this church was started with when it started in a home. Passion to reach its neighbors. Passion to invite and bring everybody in. The passion where they would go to the streets and place hands on people and pray for people to be healed. I think about the passion 33 years ago. And I think about this church in Ephesus, 43 years that have gone by. And God's like, you, you've done great work. I, I commend your toil. I commend your labor. You've not grown weary. But I have this one thing against you. You've forsaken the love, the passion, you had it first, the passion for me and the passion to reach and share this love with other people. I had a conversation with a friend about a week and a half ago, and uh, this guy was uh, an ex-heroin addict, and he's been saved for about six years, and he's now a small business owner, and, and, and God has saved him, has saved his family. And he asked me, uh, we were sitting at a breakfast, and he asked me, he said, hey, um, what are you, you, you preaching this weekend? And I said, well, thank you for asking. I'm preaching Revelation chapter 2. And in Revelation chapter 2, there's this encouragement to the church. And I, I mean, I went on. That's the best question to ask a preacher. What are you preaching this weekend? You may just end up in the message, okay? And so I begin to, to share this message in, in, in the church of Ephesus being called to return to their first love, to, to have the love, to have the passion that they had at first. And he just looked at me and he said, that's me. He said, six years ago, when God radically saved my life and broke this heroin addiction, I remember showing up to church five days a week helping clean toilets. I remember inviting co-workers to church. I remember sharing the gospel. Oh, I, I remember sharing my story about how five months ago I was shooting needles straight into my knuckles to get a high, and God came in and radically broke it. And I remember... The love that I had at first, six years have gone by. Now I've got a, a business, a small business that's somewhat successful. Now I'm working seven days a week. Let me say this. The question I want to phrase to you today. Have the blessings of God blinded you to the blesser? Have the things that you have prayed so eagerly to God about that God has shown himself faithful, has that pushed you away from what's truly important? Have we fallen more in love with the stuff of God rather than Jesus and Jesus alone? To seek first is a call to return to our first love. Him and him alone. And that business that you started, sir, awesome. But where are you at with Jesus? 
Are you using it? Are you using your influence to point people to Jesus? Some of you used to serve uh, in church at some point in your life. And you would you would be here four times on a, a month on a Sunday, greeting people, serving in kids, and and helping people meet Jesus, and serving in the parking lot. But uh, too busy now. I make six figures now, uh, and now I got to show up to a church, and I'll come once a month, and I'll bring my family once a month, and we'll just kind of walk through the motions. I'm too busy right now. Repent. Return. Do the things you did at first is the encouragement to this church. And I want to say this, that if you take a note, you can write this down. I'm going to ask the band to come on out. The proof of passion is perseverance. The proof of passion is perseverance. Listen, passion is not how loud I preach. That's a communication style. Passion is not how high I jump. Passion is what will I do when my feet hit the ground. Passion is will you still serve me when there's not a crowd looking at you on a Monday morning. Passion is, is will you still obey me when your coworkers are out and you're having a drink at the bar and there's just one drink too many. Will you still serve me? Perseverance is the proof of passion. I think of Jesus in the garden. Praying, last night of his life, sweating blood. Jesus crying out to God, saying, God, take this cup from me. But he finished it and said, but not my will, but thine be done, says the Lord. Amen. That's passion. Think about Timothy. Timothy was a young man. Leading a mega church, large church in a city, 12 to 16 years old. That's how old Timothy probably would have been, many scholars would say. Leading this mega church in this massive city. And there's a whole bunch of dissension. There's a whole bunch of division. There's a whole bunch of false doctrine that's rising up. And Timothy, you remember Timothy. Timothy had a bit of a timid personality. Paul had to encourage him many times that, that God's not giving you a spirit of fear, Timothy, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Tim Timothy leading people who were far older than him in a church that was growing and thriving. And we get to this verse in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, and there's this instruction there from Paul to Timothy. And he's leading a church in Ephesus at this time. And all this division all this dissension, all this turmoil. And it says in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Timothy must have not been feeling it anymore. Timothy must have grown tired. Timothy must have lost a little bit of that passion that he had at first. But perseverance is the proof of passion. It's getting up in front of a group of people, Timothy, when people who may not want you to be the one preaching, you're preaching the gospel to them. It's to stand up in front of a group of people when you might be an uninvited guest at this time and there's false doctrine circling all over and there's dissension and there's division and you're tackling it and taking it head on. And he doesn't say, just get out of there and go start something new. He says, remain. Listen, you don't have to tell me to remain at a place that I want to be. Here's an example. My wife and I, occasionally, we will go and get massages, right? I love a good deep tissue massage. It kind of makes you sweat, snot a little bit, all that fun stuff. I enjoy a deep tissue massage. Never once have I had a massage therapist tell me to remain on the table. Why? Because I want to be there. I've had a massage therapist say, the time's up, get up. But I have had a personal trainer say, stay down and do another push-up. Stay down and do another rep. Why? Because you don't have to tell someone to remain at a place they want to be. 
But perseverance is the proof of passion. Will you keep doing what you're doing even when it gets difficult? That when the storms of life come, you'll stand up with just solid feet in the ground and say, God, I know that it may not be working out how I thought. I know it might be the most difficult thing that I'm doing, but I'm going to stand firm because perseverance is the proof of passion. Somebody's on the verge and you're feeling like it was time to quit. It's time to give up. And God's saying, you're almost at the finish line. Don't quit now. Because perseverance is the proof of passion. God's reigniting some passion in this room today. You might be watching online and Holy Spirit's speaking to your heart and He's stirring and He's igniting and He's fanning a flame to that ember. And He's blowing it back to be a flame. Remember David, we talked about David earlier, that passion that he had in the pasture that got him to a palace. There's a time in David's life as king where he's crying out to God to restore his passion. He cries out and he says, God, would you restore to me the joy of my salvation? You see, at this time, David is in the palace and the Bible says that it was in the springtime when the kings would go off to war and David stayed back home in the comfortable palace when he should have been at war with his men during this time. Sometimes when we're not obeying God and doing the things that we're supposed to be doing, we make dumb decisions. So he sees this lady on the top rooftop of his palace and he sees her bathing. So he calls for one of his men to go and the command was for this lady named Bathsheba to sleep with David and they conceived a child, the Bible says, and now David is crying out to God because he just got news that that child has passed. He's saying, God, would you restore to me? Restore to me that passion. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. See, some of you are crying out right now to God and God's stirring a passion on the inside of you. Listen, you're not your past. You are not the bad decisions that you've made. David realized, listen, I can't get the bad decisions that I've made back, but I can get my passion back. And some of you need to be reignited and reminded that though you may have lost your character, though you may have lost some integrity, though you may have lost some some, some money, though you may have done some dumb things, the truth is, is you can get your passion back. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Time had gone by. There's something about time that we become so apathetic. Because that little shepherd boy, David, that little teenager, is now in a palace as an older man. I don't know if 43 years have gone by like the church of Ephesus, but some time has gone by. Somebody today has been following Jesus for some time. God's saying, do the things you did at first. Return to your first love. Repent and do. So the question today that you're thinking is, how do I get my passion back? How do I get my passion back? The answer is in Revelation chapter 2. Because our passion doesn't come back by screaming out, God, give me my passion back. It doesn't work. It's not what we were commanded to do. We were commanded to do two things in Revelation chapter 2. One is to repent. To repent. It's the first instruction given to the church. Repent. Repent is to turn to God. Repent is to say, God, I'm sorry for the junk that I filled my life with. I'm sorry that I've allowed this promotion. I'm sorry that I've allowed this relationship to get in and interfere with the relationship that I have with you. And so, God, I'm repenting for the things that I've decided. I'm owning my mistakes. I'm owning my decisions. And I'm repenting. The second instruction was required with action. Because I don't think we just get passion back by asking for it. The instruction to the church in Ephesus was to repent and to do. Do the things you did at first. So how do I get my passion back? I don't know. What did you do when you were first saved? What did you do when you first found out the good news of the gospel? action involved one of the best ways for you to get your passion back 
It's probably to share your story or to share this good news with somebody else. To me, that's the greatest form of discipleship. It's when we're walking and we're living out the great commission. Repent and do things that you did at first. I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet throughout this room. I feel like this is a holy moment where God, the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. He's illuminating, he's showing some areas in your life that there may have been some chains, some chains that maybe some other people have put on your life, some chains that maybe you have put on your life through your own decisions. And today we're saying, God, we want our passion back. God, we're repenting and we're gonna do the things that we did at first. And God, we're gonna ask you to remove some things today that may have gotten in the way, some things that, that we've allowed to get in the way, some chains that we've picked up along the way. God, we let go. We ask you to break those chains today and we worship you in freedom with all adoration today, not letting anything hold us back because there is good news and the good news is Jesus. And this is why we're so passionate. Passion is not me trying to make something up. Passion is a response to the passionate love of God who gave his one and only son who took my place on a cross who's the remedy for the sickness of our soul called sin and it is Jesus and Jesus alone and it is him that we worship today and he is the chain breaker it is because he's risen from the dead that he's alive and he's active and it is that Jesus that we worship today and so I wonder Lighthouse Church will you worship in freedom today will you worship God and say God I thank you for who you are God I thank you that you're with me because there truly is power that is in the name of Jesus. Oh.